Sorry, firstly, I've got to apologize. I'm old-fashioned enough that I need um, uh, paper and ink. It's, um, I, I dearly wish I was like my children where I, I don't. So anyway, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Blakeway, and standing beside me should be um, our pet Labrador, Parker, uh, who is a, um, uh, a retired guide dog. And, um, uh, but sadly, as we were told only this afternoon, um, there's no dogs allowed in the building. Even guide dogs, unless you're blind, and, and I'm not. So, uh, as we all know, um, rules are made to be followed, aren't they? <laughs> no, seriously, a, a, a imagination, please. No. So, as some of you may know, I spend my time as a chef, food writer, food presenter, um, and, and Parker spends his time as a family pet. Um, as a passionate foodie, I could stand here and spout on endlessly. And uh, I, there's a clock here that's counting me down, which is really worrying. <laughs> uh, I could spout on endlessly about the food industry because it gives me gifts every single day with what it does to our food supply. However, tonight I wanted to ask you all a really surprising question. And that is, should we eat our pets? <laughs> it's it's post-dinner. Um, should we eat our pets? My answer is yes. I'll just let that sit on the room for a moment. Um, or at least sort of. Um, at, at this point, I'd actually trained Parker to look really nervous. And it, it, it's the cutest thing to see a Labrador looking nervous. Um, but uh, instead, I'll just sort of crack on with uh, really where, where I want to go. I want to tell you a little story before we tuck into the pet later on um, <laughs> that proves that the Kiwi icon, Graham Kerr, one of the first global celebrity chefs, was frankly way before his time. Late last year, a government scientist in Ireland um, had a few thousand euros left over um, you know, in his budget at the end of, you know, getting towards the end of the financial year, you know what council budgets can be like. Is there any council? Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, uh, got to be used up, don't they? So he decided, you know, without asking permission or seeking advice from any of the powers that be, to do some equine DNA testing on processed beef products on our supermarket shelves. To his total shock, this testing came back positive. Wouldn't you guys love to have been a fly on the wall of that office that day? Can you imagine? You know, holy horse. What started off as a budget preservation exercise rapidly developed into a national and then international scandal as it became public throughout the world. For the first time, we all became aware of just how powerful the big boys in the food industry had become. As the race to oblivion progressed, down at the first hurdle <laughs> went the small companies, yeah, the little boys, with the big boys that are telling us, oh, it's just a few little horses got in and, you know, don't worry about it, it's not important. By the second fence, the big boys are stumbling too. And down goes, oh, down goes Nestle, down goes, the list goes on, Tesco's, Nestle. Short while later, Burger King are following suit. Then Ikea. I thought they made furniture. <laughs> I was sure they made furniture. But apparently, they make an awful lot of what they thought were beef meatballs. Of some description. Anyway, by this time, it was impossible to hide the fact that this was massive. This was meat substitution on an unprecedented scale. We're talking hundreds of thousands of kilos of horse masquerading as beef. <laughs> <coughs> I love that one. <laughs> we all watched as the flurry of blame bounced around Europe like some sort of international point to point, waiting for the, uh, the, the, the food industry's PR teams to you know, wake up and, and 
turn this, you know, they needed to spin this into the non-event that they really desperately needed. To use a weak pun, it was a bit late to slab the, slam the stable door after the horse had been bolted. <laughs> but slam it, they certainly tried. With the spin of, so sorry about that, we didn't know what those nasty Eastern Europeans were up to, and, you know, they followed that up with, with positive little stories about how horse meat's really healthy and our, our grandparents ate it during the war. Beggar's belief. Anyway, we were so quickly placated with the idea that it won't happen again, and wrong though it was, the meat was actually okay to eat. The food industry's smoke and mirrors department moved us away from Neddy the Nag and onto the growing royal bump in a matter of weeks, hoping that we wouldn't notice the true scale of the problem. So, what happened? What went wrong? Firstly, let's cover the eating horse meat thing. Um, I don't actually have a problem with eating horse. Being English, it's not part of my cultural background. But I have actually eaten it once in France um, in a restaurant. I, my French kind of let me down a wee bit. Uh, I thought Chavot was lamb. <laughs> it's a simple mistake. It caused a huge amount of fun at the table. Um, the French friends thought it was, they didn't tell me, but then that's the French. Um, <laughs> so why did it end up in our processed food? And I do mean our processed food, because in New Zealand, we are part of the global food network, just without the benefit of renegade Irish scientists. Our toothless food standards agency has no laboratory. It relies solely on manufacturer-produced science, which means we have no way of knowing. Impossible to confirm or deny. But let's be honest. Do we really think that the English, the Irish, the French are the only sneaky ones? I don't. This all started when another dodgy product was made public and effectively removed from the ingredient list of the food processor. That being chemically or mechanically recovered meat, which I won't go into um, in detail because there might be a vegetarian in the house. <clears throat> and if there isn't before I start, there will be after I finish. Um, it was more affectionately known as pink slime. This disgusting stuff was the cheap meat protein filler that was shipped and used around the world in almost all cheap processed food for the masses, with prices constantly being forced down. A replacement had to be found, otherwise the multi-billion dollar profits of our food industry would have suffered. In this incredibly cutthroat business, the temporary stopgap was horse. It's great, isn't it? Pink slime to horse. This wouldn't be so bad if what we were talking about was herds of free-ranging horses roaming the hillsides. No drugs, no... Be, be okay. If your culture says, eat horse, which, you know, sadly mine doesn't. But we're not. We're not talking about that image. In markets around the world, they call them the kill buyer. And frankly, they used to be the last stage between fertilizer and glue. These people are buying up any and all of the old and decrepit horses and then shipping them across national boundaries to be killed and butchered in places where currency is more important than provenance. In Ireland alone, it is estimated that over 70,000 horses have gone missing illegally. That's not the legally bought and shipped, it's the illegal ones. In the last 12 months, and an estimated 4 million across Europe, illegally. This isn't a food industry, it's a criminal conspiracy. When horses are sold and sometimes stolen, for example in Virginia, transported alive to Mexico and sadly Canada, um, the French side of Canada still has uh, the right to kill, to butcher horse meat for 
human consumption. So that's the route that they take out of America. They get butchered and processed and exported as miscellaneous meat protein to Europe. We're beginning to see the size and the scale of the problem, and that's just the start of the journey. To give you an example of the global scale of a product that sells for less than $5, we look at the uh, frozen meals from the Findus company in England. who subcontracted the manufacturer to a French company, who used, uh, who bought the, the meat through an agent in Cyprus, who was using an abattoir in Romania and a processing plant in Holland. When a frozen lasagna in England, selling less than $5, can be marked 100% beef when it is 100% horse and it's been on a world tour, I'm sorry, it beggars belief. And if that wasn't enough, and I'll pause now, because having worked out this next sentence, I've yet to manage to get it out in one piece. So, as if that wasn't enough, we now have no way of knowing what we didn't know was there in the first place. Many of the veterinary drugs that are used on horses are extremely dangerous in human beings. Uh, probably the most common is, is bute, uh, an anti-inflammatory, um, commonly known as the horse aspirin. And it is proven to be carcinogenic in humans. It's banned practically everywhere. Um, and now, for the first time, is starting to show up in our food supply around the world. So, who's at fault here? Is it the criminals? After all, they've been sourcing horses from around the world and fraudulently slipping them into our food chain. Or maybe the food uh, manufacturers who have turned our food into a commodity that can be shipped and traded like coal. Perhaps we should look at the supermarkets. <laughs> For constantly driving supply costs down while increasing their profits. Or maybe the government for not making sure that this didn't happen in the first place. Now, these are all good possibilities for our anger, but there's one small problem, a problem that I can't get away from. When you wander through your chosen food retailer and you put your hand on a budget burger, you know that the meat in there has to be so cheap that it can only have been jet washed off the front bumper of a truck on the bad day on the desert road. We have to say we only have ourselves to blame. We have allowed our food supply to become a commodity. We have stopped caring. So, should we eat our pets? Well, sorry to have to say this, we probably already have here. Not our own pets. And please don't feel like you have to admit it's not. <laughs> <coughs> but certainly some child's pet horse has cantered into our cheap processed food. The cheap processed food that we buy when we can't be bothered or we're too busy to take responsibility for our food supply. Now, I'm not suggesting that we serve Labrador canapes tonight. And I know Dave Pearson, who does the, um, the food here very well, and uh, he wouldn't do that. But I do passionately believe that we should treat our food as we treat our pets. And that, for me, is the big question. These two hairy beasties uh, are what food pets should be. For more than two years, they were very affectionately known as lunch and dinner. <laughs> lunch is the far one and dinner was the near one. And they proved to me and my family that we should care what goes in and how they are treated. We should take back our food supply. We must learn to look our food in the eye once again <laughs> and not let the murkier aspects of the food industry take away our choice because it is our 
choice. The simple fact is, what we eat is the single most important decision that we make every single day for our short, medium, and long-term health and well-being. Please don't take that decision lightly. Now, to finish, I'd like to uh, butcher a couple of verses of a wonderful poem by uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you'll recognize it as I get going. Forward the galloping gourmets, was there a man dismayed? Not though the public knew, someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the four million. Tesco's to right of them, Nestle to left of them, Burger King in front of them. Volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell. Boldly they rode, and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the four million. Thank you.